Welcome, listeners, to Briefcase Crimes. I'm Hannah, and I'm full of terrifying facts about horrific events. I'm Liz, and I am full of morbid curiosity. Elizabeth. Yes, Hannah. Trick or treat. Ooh. Smell my feet. Give me something good to eat. This is our halloween episode yay this will be this will be airing the day before halloween that's exciting it is very exciting so i thought we would do something that fit the bill Mm -hmm. if you will that rhymes there's a lot of different crimes that happened on halloween or around halloween or about halloween Hmm. so i had i had a lot to choose from but i picked one that i feel works best for us i wonder if there's a lot of them just because it happens to be halloween and people think it's even weirder like they end up being higher profile there are there are some that are uh like they just happened to be on halloween Mm -hmm. there are some that i don't know (laughs) i don't know how to explain this so there are some there are two at least that i didn't choose that are like high profile serial killers that killed on halloween um, but they also killed a bunch of other people on a bunch of other dates. Right. Those ones, I think, just happened to be on Halloween. I don't Probably. think any of them are because Halloween. Mm-hmm. But there is one that I almost chose that is the reason why the, like, big scare about checking your children's candy Ugh, came about. Yeah. I hate that. Yeah. So I was going to do that one, and then I thought, that's been done before. <laughs> If you want to listen to that, you can go to another podcast. They exist. I know My Favorite Murder has covered it. I'm sure other ones have as mm-hmm. well. But this one that I chose is one that I haven't ever heard talked about before. It's possible that it has been. I haven't listened to every murder podcast and every episode of every murder podcast. But right. we're going to talk today about the the murder of Peter Fabiano. Okay. Okay, so this this case takes place in Sun Valley, which is around LA. We're in we're in California in 1957. Mm-hmm. And it happens on Halloween, October 31st. Spoopy. Very spoopy. So, around 11 p.m., there's a knock on the door of the Fabiano residence. Peter and his wife Betty had already gone to bed, and his stepdaughter Judy, who was Betty's daughter, 15 years old, she had also already gone to bed. Okay. They did have Betty's son, Richard. So Peter had two stepkids. Mm -hmm. He had Richard and he had Judy. Judy lived with them. Richard was in the Navy. Okay. So Richard had come over that night, but he had already returned to the base for the night. So Richard's gone. Peter, Betty, and Judy are all in their separate bedrooms, their, Mm -hmm. their bedrooms. So around 11 p.m., there's a knock on the door, and Peter assumed it was a, just, like, a really late trick-or-treater. Sure. I think that's what I would assume. Yeah. He took the candy bowl, and he went down to the door. Betty heard him open the door and say yes, and then he said, it's a little late for this, isn't it? Ooh. Like, it's a little late for trick-or-treating, right? Yeah. It's, like, true, but there's some sass behind it. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, there's a couple different, like iterations of that Mm -hmm. there's like isn't it a little late for this it's a little late for this kind of thing but the one i saw most often was it's a little late for this isn't it Mm -hmm. she also heard but didn't recognize two other voices okay she said one sounded masculine and the other sounded like a man impersonating a woman interesting Mm -hmm. that might make more sense later but okay we'll get there yeah then she heard what she described as a pop like a gun pop? Like a gun pop, yes. Okay. The gun pop <laughs> woke, sorry, the gun pop woke up her and Judy. They both mm-hmm. heard it. Sure. And they they ran out of bed to the front door. I don't know. If I heard a gun pop, I don't think I'd run to it. Sorry, Scott. Even if it was your husband? I was going to say even if it was your husband. <laughs> no, I probably would. Maybe not if I was Judy. If it was my stepfather, yeah. maybe not. I don't have well, a stepfather, so it's all hypothetical anyway. But yeah. <laughs> Your hypothetical stepdad? It's like it's like running to the basement like, or going into the basement in a horror movie. Like, just yeah. stop it. <laughs> going toward the scary noise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they both go to the front door. Mm-hmm. And they find Peter lying on his back, bleeding profusely from a gunshot wound to his chest. Oh, wow. Terrifying. 
not what you're expecting uh-uh. on Halloween night uh-uh. when you've already gone to bed. Betty ran over to their neighbor Bud Alper's house, and Bud called the police. Neighbors always come through. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Well, I just saw this video on TikTok of this family whose house caught fire, mm-hmm. and it's like a ring doorbell video. And you just see the neighbor in their boxers sprinting with this super long, like, extendable ladder because the whole family was trapped on the second floor. Oh, my god! And they got everybody out safely before the fire department even arrived. And I'm like, neighbor man coming through. I think the moral of our podcast is, like, neighbors are the real MVPs. Seriously. Like, everyone complains about a nosy neighbor, but... Yeah, but the neighbors are always the ones who hear it, call the police, all of that. Yeah. Ask who's that strange man. Oh, it's just my vagabond half brother. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Bud called the police and they arrived minutes after the shooting. They got there like super fast. And they rushed Peter to the Sun Valley Hospital where he unfortunately died. Mm-hmm. The bullet had entered his chest just below his heart. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there really wasn't a lot that they could do. Yeah, that's sad. In true briefcase crimes fashion, let us now back up. All right. Waiting for it. Yeah. I mean, it's going to happen a couple times. Just a spoiler for you. That's okay. Keep things interesting and spicy. Peter Fabiano was a former U.S. Marine Mm -hmm. who had served in World War II. He was working as a truck driver when he met and married Betty. Your first slide here is Peter and Betty. It's the only picture that I have of them. Aw, they're cute. Yes. So this this was dubbed the trick-or-treat slaying mm-hmm. because of obvious reasons. Yeah, something that, like, I don't think you would ever see today. I just think it's kind of interesting. It doesn't really change anything. But I really like that the caption on the picture is slaying a victim because you would never see like a newspaper use the term slaying like that I don't think Mm -mm. in 2020. No. They met while he was a truck driver and they married and they lived in Kingston, New York. Mm -hmm. Peter continued to be a truck driver. Pays well. Eventually for whatever reason. This is a a case that is sparse of detail Mm -hmm. about the extraneous things but for whatever reason. The pair moved to California in 1956, one year before the murder, with Betty's children, and they opened a few hair salons. Mm. Peter was a hairstylist. That was his his occupation. So they owned and operated these hair salons. Sure. I don't know what year this happened, but at some point, uh, a woman named Joan Rabel came looking for a job, Mm -hmm. and Peter hired her on. Now, she was from philadelphia they think okay she was like a freelance photographer she had gone back and forth from hawaii and on some of her stuff from that like those excursions she had written that she was born in philadelphia she was from philadelphia Mm -hmm. so they think she was born in philadelphia but there's a lot of different stories about where she came from but she starts working for the fabiano family Mm -hmm. and she and betty become really close friends really fast Mm -hmm. then a little bit down the road here and this all has to happen within the year leading up to the murder right because they only have a year right but at some point in that time peter and betty began having some marital problems okay unspecified marital problems okay i can't find any resources that say exactly what was going on but they were having some issues sure And so during that time, Betty went to stay with Joan Rabel at her house. I don't know where Judy was. I hope with Joan. I hope she wasn't like, yeah, I need some time apart, but our daughter, my daughter can still live here. Yeah, that would be weird. I would assume that they went together. Judy is really only mentioned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, never comes back. Well, that's all right to not include the, uh. Or not involve the 15-year-old. I guess. But, like, she's not involved. Like, she doesn't do anything else to do with this. Mm -hmm. She doesn't like Nancy Drew herself. She doesn't become a detective, Judy. (laughs) And solve the killing of her stepfather. Yeah. It'd be cool if she did. Yeah, it would. I don't know if anyone would have taken her seriously as a 15-year-old girl in 1957, though. Let's be real. What what time period does Nancy Drew take place in? That's a great question. Because I know... You know who would... 
Rose. You know who would know this? My well, mom. Kathy. Oh. Kathy has read every Nancy Drew. See, my mom read them all growing up, too. Kathy. We need to get Kathy and Rose together. Yeah. They would love each other. I think so, probably. I don't know when Nancy Drew took place, though. I could Google it really quick. Please do. I will. I've never read a Nancy Drew. I've read, like, a couple, because we had a couple growing up, but I never, like, got super into them. But we had a few because mom liked them. Kyle read the Hardy Boys, though. Oh, that makes sense. I remember Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys being a thing, Mm -hmm. like being around. They had like, they had um, like books where they would like get together too. Mm, Like the crossover of the century. Yeah. Wow. The Nancy Drew book series started in 1930. Is she contemporary to her publishing? I don't know. Like, I can't get, like, a solid answer, so maybe. Probably. Maybe I should read a Nancy Drew. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it has to, it has to just kind of change with the books, because, first of all, it started in the 30s. It ended in 03. (laughs) Is it the same author? Oh, I couldn't possibly. A hundred-year-old man. (laughs) Or a woman. I don't know who wrote Nancy Drew. But, like, I'm seeing some where it takes place in the 90s, some in the 80s, so it has to just change. OG Nancy Drew in the 30s. Right. Okay. Now that we've gone on this huge tangent, Mm -hmm. please vote in the comments. Do you prefer the Nancy Drew tangent or the yeast tangent? Oh, God. The best. (laughs) (laughs) So Betty went to go stay with Joan. Mm Mm-hmm. The papers of the time describe the relationship between Betty and Joan as, quote, abnormal. Okay. That's specific. (laughs) Well, 1957, calling a relationship between two women abnormal. Listen, what is the term? I, I learned a term, and I can't remember it, like lavender roommates or something? That doesn't sound like anything. Or lavender I know. marriage, maybe it was. Do you want to Google it, Nancy Drew? <sighs> yeah, it's a, it's a gay thing. So I mean, I don't know when exactly that it was like coined in in uh, like old Hollywood. Yeah, lavender marriage. Okay, lavender marriage. Yeah, so a lavender Ooh. marriage is a male female mixed marriage undertaken as a marriage of convenience to conceal the socially oh. stigmatized sexual sexual orientation of one or both partners so it's a beard yeah pretty much but okay. they used to call it a lavender marriage because like mm-hmm. in old hollywood it was very common for marriages to be arranged yeah and so a lot of these women had no interest in being married necessarily these old hollywood starlets so they would just be in a lavender marriage well that comes up a couple times in this yeah in this case um i don't know if betty was a homosexual mm-hmm. or a bisexual i don't know her her preference mm-hmm. but the newspapers of the time say that it was an abnormal relationship mm-hmm. and some sources there aren't a ton of sources about this and a lot of them are like little blog posts so like i don't know their credibility or credentials i will link all of my sources in the brief as always but was there a book there is no diary. <laughs> I wish. We would know so much more. Oh, is there a book? Yeah. Did you read it? <laughs> there is not a book about this. I do not think. If okay. there is, please let me know. But I don't think there is. Okay. I thought you meant, was there a diary full of the illicit details? No. Well, we have had a lot of diaries recently. But no, that's no not diary. what I meant. No diary. No book that I know of. Okay. Didn't try to look for one. Didn't read a book if there is one. Right. Read a lot of little blog posts. One of the blog posts that I saw said that Betty had admitted having an affair with Joan to Peter, but I don't know where they got that information. I don't, I didn't get an annotated bibliography. Right. But after she stayed with Joan for a period of time, she and Peter decided that they would reconcile. Mm-hmm. They could get back together and try to work on things. Peter's one condition was... I want you to cut off all communication with Joan Rabel. Oof. Which I think that's where people kind of like, that's quite a reaction. Yeah. If there wasn't something going on. I don't know, though, because he could have just been abusive. He could have. You know, like there's a lot of background that we don't have, you know, because 
I mean, I don't want to throw around accusations or anything, but he moved with her to an isolated place, and then the only person she got close with, he then tried to isolate her from. That's true. And when you say isolated, you mean isolated from people that she knew. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yes, from family. You're not trying to say L.A. is an isolated place. Right, and like it's not like she was holed up in his attic, but... (laughs) <laughs> no it's also possible that they moved to this location to be close to richard in the navy right that's what i was thinking actually because if he was just there they yeah. could just be like yeah let's just go we yeah. wanted to retire well, in california anyway or i don't know it's it's the same thing with like my dad my dad was in the marines mm-hmm. and my dad was stationed at for for a chunk of time at cherry point which is in jacksonville north carolina uh-huh well i don't know the exact details i wasn't born yet but my mom and my sister were there. And at some point, my my dad's parents also moved down there and his sister did. Because my whole life, my grandparents and then my dad's sister until she died when I was a child, they lived in Jacksonville. Like, yeah, I don't know if they went for him. I don't know if they just like visited and were like, this is a really nice place. I'm going to move. But it's not unheard of. Yeah, they could have just not had anything going for them in New York and... If he was moving, it was a good opportunity. Like, who knows? Mm-hmm. Well, they were doing pretty good. He, They owned businesses. They were they were fine. Yeah. For whatever reason, she had to cut off this communication with Joan. Right. Some sources say that he wouldn't even let her, like, talk about Joan or, like, say Joan's name mm-hmm. or anything in the house. And it's, you say about not wanting to throw around accusations, but... A lot of accusations get thrown around, so we'll get to those later. But Okay. So now we're going to jump forward again, back to Halloween night. I like how you said that. We're going to jump forward back to Halloween. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to jump back to the future. Yes. Yes, we're going to jump back to where we started. Right. Forward in time, back to where we started. Mm-hmm. So police were struggling to find a motive for the murder. Mm-hmm. He was well-liked. He didn't really have enemies. He even brought the candy bowl to the door with him. He did. That was my thing is he was just like, oh, this must be a trick or treater. It's like, I'm going to I'm going to scold them, but I'm still going to give them candy because I'm not that bad of a person, I guess. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I I have thoughts. I have thoughts. We'll get there. So they couldn't find any shells. Mm hmm. Couldn't find anything. And it looked a lot like it was what it's a lot of the stuff I say or I saw said it looked like it had the hallmarks of a gang related crime. Interesting. But when they say that, I think they mean like the mob. Right. I was thinking like the Bloods and the Crips. No. <laughs> but no. Like it was it meant like crime syndicates. Right. Well, that might have been obvious to you, but it sure wasn't for me. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Because in my head, I'm just like, oh, it's like organized crime. Like they knew to pick up the shells. They knew to Mm. do this or that. Yeah, well, that's what they thought too. They thought organized crime, this is some sort of like crime syndicate thing. Mm -hmm. So they start looking into his criminal past, his record, and he doesn't really have one. He he does have a charge from 1948 for bookmaking. Okay. So meaning meaning gambling. Yeah. For those who don't know, it wasn't like you're going to go to prison because you made a journal. Also, like I'm sketchy on the years, but I learned recently that literally even things like bingo used to be considered gambling. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot to me. No. I watched this whole thing about how carnival games were outlawed because they mm-hmm. were considered gambling. So like who even knows? Yeah, I'm assuming from like 1948 that it was just that he had like put a formal bet on something at a bookie. Yeah. So he got a small charge for that, but that doesn't link him to like an organized crime syndicate. Right. You know, and that's what they come up with, too. They're like, this guy had nothing to do with that. So why is this such a, you know, for lack of a better word, such a like clean hit, Mm -hmm. I guess. Right. Sure. So they go to Betty But Betty has to be sedated for a little bit. Betty is like in such shock over this that she has to be sedated. Right. I think she was sedated for like a week. But I'm squishy. I'm squishy on the details about like when she was able to to get up and about. But while they were waiting for her, they found the only other witness to the crime who was a teenage boy 
who saw the getaway car as the shooter sped away. Okay. But he didn't see anything else. He doesn't have any other details. He just knows that there was a car and that it sped away. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Betty is good to go. She's up and about enough to give them some information. And the only thing she can offer them is the name of the only person who would possibly have a motive to kill Peter. And that is, in her mind, Joan Rabel. Mm -hmm. So the police go and arrest her immediately. (laughs) Jeez. Yeah, that's all they need is one one word from the drugged up widow and they're arresting her, but they don't have anything else. They've got literally nothing. And like I'm imagining in my head, like the conversation is probably like, do you know of anyone who didn't like your husband? Well, yeah, my old friend. Wink. Yeah. Like my friend, like in that in my head, like that's how that went down. And the police are just like, let's go get our girls or boys, whoever the police are, boys. Let's go get our boys, boys. <laughs> in the 50s. Boys. Yeah. Sorry. They they go like kick in her door. <laughs> yeah. I forgot about this. The next slide. There aren't many slides, but the next slide is a an L.A. Times article that has this is the top headline. Oh, wow. Even more so than a plane crashing. Well, because the 16 aboard escape injury. Yeah. But no, this man, mystery caller, kills man answering bell. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's like the actual article on there anywhere, but oh, yeah, it is. It's the like middle. If you go to the middle, it's the one to the left of it, I think. Oh, yeah, I see it. So the police go and kick in Joan's door. They probably don't. I don't know, but they arrest her. They bring her down to the to the station and they question her about her whereabouts on Mm -hmm. Halloween night. Sure. Because she's their only lead. She's it. She told them that she was home all night and that the presence of her car in the driveway proved that. I was home. My car was in the driveway. I didn't go anywhere. And her neighbors agreed, yes, the car was in the driveway. Okay. That, to me, is not a very strong alibi. No, it's not. The police agree that is not a strong alibi. (laughs) Yeah. So they they start interviewing Joan's friends and acquaintances. And they find a woman named margaret barrett and she tells them yeah joan borrowed my car on halloween and i think it was it was margaret's husband said she borrowed the car and put like 37 miles on it okay i don't know what the current mileage of my car is like i know roundabouts but i wouldn't be able to say like you took it and you put however many miles on it no me neither unless it was a lot yeah i wouldn't be able to tell you So they come back to her and they're like, hey, lady, your car was here all night, but you borrowed the Barrett's car. What's Mm -hmm. up with that? And she says, "Okay, I did borrow it, but I borrowed it to go get groceries. Okay. So sus. Yeah. And honestly, 37 miles sounds like a lot to get groceries in the 50s where like every neighborhood had a little grocery store. Mm -hmm. But also why not take your own car that was in the driveway? Yeah, that's a great question. And why lie about it when the police ask? Beats me. Because you've got something to hide, Joan. Pretty much. But that's not enough to, like, bring somebody to trial for murder. Right. Lying to the police is not enough to bring you on a murder charge. As we've mentioned, very circumstantial. Incredibly circumstantial evidence. So the case grows cold. Mm -hmm. They release her because they have got nothing to hold her with. They just know she's acting a little suspicious. Mm -hmm. Eventually, some sources say two weeks, some sources say about a month. But at some point within the next month, the police are called to the L.A. branch of the Bullock Department Store. Okay. Apparently, in the ye olde times... In the 50s, there were these like lock boxes or or safe deposit boxes or something that you could rent out at the department stores. Hmm. It's not something I've ever heard of before, but it is something that happens in this case. Yeah. So in one of these lock boxes, they found a gun. And so they called the police. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know if that was against the rules. I don't know. But they're like, hey, there's a gun in one of these. So it was reported to the police. I don't know if this was just like a locker or something. Like, I genuinely have no idea. Yeah, maybe it was just a locker. What's up with this? Yeah. Like, because I'm trying to think about why they would be opening them. 
and why they would be like, there's a gun in here. I don't think it's like a safe deposit box because you can put guns in safe deposit boxes. Yeah, it would have to be like you didn't pay for your locker this month, so we're going to empty it and give it to somebody else maybe. Maybe it's like storage wars. Yeah. (laughs) So they called the police. The police are like, okay, there's a gun here. So for whatever reason, they did they did ballistics testing on the gun and they matched it to the weapon used to kill Peter Fabiano. Okay. So we have a weapon. We have a weapon. It is confirmed that this is the weapon. She should have thrown it in the La Brea tar pits. Honestly, or buried it. Yeah. Buried it under her neighbor. Her neighbor. See, neighbors are the real MVPs because that was a neighbor that buried Otto's gun yep. under his rose bush. Yep. Be friends with your neighbors because they'll either <laughs> solve your murder or help you cover up a murder. One or the other. Yeah. There are. There's no in between. <laughs> so they look into who owned or rented or whatever whoever had contact with this lockbox right and they find a woman named goldine pizer okay now my first thought with the name goldine is this woman is a pokemon (laughs) that's right where my brain went Mm -hmm. was a pokemon let's back up again (laughs) okay second time now we talked about lavender marriages. Mm-hmm. So Goldine Pizer was born in Illinois to German immigrants. Okay. And at some point she moved to LA and took up work as a medical secretary. Okay. In 1944, she was briefly married to a pharmacist at a naval hospital named Herbert Chrome. Mm. The pair divorced like not long after. Mm-hmm. And Goldine began, I don't know how openly... But she was dating women actively. Okay. She was, like, known to date women. Good for her. I don't think that she was like, I'm a lesbian. I think she was just, like, on the down low dating women. Uh Uh-huh. So, Goldie and Pizer confirmed lesbian. Mm Mm-hmm. This is not a, like, abnormal relationship confirmed bachelor code of the day. Like, Mm -hmm. we know she was dating women. We need, like, a stamper, like, just... (laughs) Chunk yeah. confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> See, you a, knew what I big, meant. A big rainbow flag. Yeah. But yeah, she had a lavender marriage, mm-hmm. if you will. And so did Joan Rabel for a time. She also got divorced. Mm. And eventually, Joan Rabel found her way into Goldian's life. Mm-hmm. Now, Joan described the relationship as they were coffee clatch friends. Uh-huh. Like going for a, for a coffee clatch, which is a thing that i know about it's a pennsylvania dutch thing i believe the idea of a oh clash. i thought i thought it was just like a cute little nickname for your girl Mm-mm. club no it's like we go out for we go have like fika together oh like that's uh, cute let me, double, let me double check that because i that is a term i have heard i just thought it was like how like you mean yeah. the girls call ourselves the coven they like called themselves the coffee clutch no <laughs> Apparently, this is a a trend from the 50s, but it comes from the German word Kaffeeklatscht, which means coffee and gossip. So literally fika. Cute. It's literally fika. Why yeah, don't we have a word that just means coffee and gossip? I have heard of this. I always thought it was a Pennsylvania Dutch thing. Always. Because like we've talked about before, I'm from the middle of Pennsylvania. Well, it probably is because it came over at the same time as the people or the people brought it over is what i mean to say (laughs) yeah remember joan was from philly yeah so it's entirely possible but she basically is like we're just like we're just friends who go have like little coffee dates and Mm -hmm. gossip and talk about stuff like we just go have our little fika time during these coffee clatches this fika time Mm -hmm. they became really close And Joan confided in Goldine about this man in her life who was very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Joan told her he was evil. He sold drugs. He was gay. Okay, John Mulaney. He's new in town. (laughs) When I started saying it, it just felt right. That's all right. She told him he was evil. He sold drugs. He destroyed all the people around him. And that he was abusive toward his innocent wife, Betty. What did I say? And that man was 
Albert Einstein. That means- <laughs> <laughs> you got me. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, that's true. She had nothing to do with it. No. She told him, this man's name is Peter Fabiano. He's my former employer. And he is bad news bears. Pretty soon, it was like Peter Fabiano became all that they talked about for months. That's all that she talked about to her. And she convinced Goldine that Peter needed to be eliminated. I wish that there was a sound for the face that I'm making. It's just like, I don't know. I love you, okay? But if you came to me obsessed about somebody, wouldn't stop talking about them, and then was like, we've got to kill them. I mean, I don't think I'd be on board with that. No, I think you'd talk me down I'm from pretty it. sure. Yeah, well, this was a different, these were two different kinds of personalities than ours. And much like the case of Holman Parker, they had a different relationship than ours. Yeah, I mean, which... For that, I'm I'm grateful. I don't think I'd like to have that. I'm you know, I'm help good. With me? Nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'd rather me too. I'd rather just. I was gonna say I I'd, I'd rather just like talk about them behind their back, which like that's when the al- when the alternative is murder, I'm gonna say it. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that if if you or I came to each other and said, "There's this terrible man. He's abusive toward his wife. He's selling drugs. He's destroying everybody around him. He's evil." We would probably find a different way to handle him. Like, you know, trying to help the wife. Yeah. Legal action, getting the authorities involved, getting somebody involved who can actually help and not just being like, well, we got to take matters into our own hands. Yeah. Like, just be a domestic abuse advocate. Yeah. No, that's not what happens. I wish that's what's happening. Well, it was also legal to beat your wife at this point still, so. There are some rumors or some theories that Betty also had a hand in this. Okay. Those are unsubstantiated. Sure. There's not really evidence that proves it. There's not anything behind it. There's just, that's a theory that's been posited. Hmm. Is that Betty was involved somehow. Interesting. Yeah. I need more information. I need a diary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somebody, for once, I'm advocating for a diary, please. Wait, 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 wait. Did they check Betty's backyard for a gun tree? <laughs> no, the gun went to the Bullock's department store. Ugh. They should have planted a gun tree. That would have been it. That's all the evidence you need. If you have a gun tree in your yard, you are for sure guilty. <laughs> 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 so instead of getting the authorities involved or getting somebody qualified to handle this kind of thing mental health worker domestic domestic abuse uh worker on september 21st 1957 goldine went to a gun shop in pasadena Mm -hmm. with money given to her by joan rabel okay and she purchased a 38 special okay not a wimpy gun for ladies, <laughs> I but also, a real gun for manly burglars. That's right. I also don't know much about guns, but I really like that it's called a special. Special? Yeah. I fired a thirty-eight special. Have you? Was it special? I have. Uh, it felt like firing a pistol. Yeah. See, this other thing is like I immediately like when you say a gun shop in pasadena i have a picture in my brain Mm -hmm. because i have i spent a lot of my childhood in gun shops yeah like i come from a gun family so i know exactly this place that's the thing like my family hunts i've shot guns i just have no interest so i just don't know the details i also grew up in a home though where every gun that was used on tv i was quizzed about (laughs) <laughs> the same with cars see my what kind of gun is that what kind of car is that in my house it was ju- we got quizzed on the radio who sings this oh gosh but like also 38 i'm assuming is 38 caliber yes what is the, what's the special even stand for what makes it special yeah what makes it special like is there a regular 38 that's not special so 38 is shorter tapered and has a different bullet diameter a 38 special has a longer casing, straight walled, and has more power, apparently. Huh. I mean, okay. we need my dad. I mean, I think I kind of get it, though. So, it, regardless, she purchases a handgun. Yeah. And the guy behind the counter 
is like, what are you, what are you buying this for? Mm-hmm. Which is my nightmare. Uh. I hate that. I we went to Joanne's and I bought fabric for my Halloween costume. Mm-hmm. You know this. It's n- it's so much. It's better during Halloween. Yeah. Because you can be like, oh, I'm making my Halloween costume. I had a pattern. So the lady was like, oh, are you making what you have? I don't want to spoil it because you don't know what I'm being. Right. But she was like, oh, are you making the thing from the pattern with this? And I was like, I sure am. And then we just talked about like buying fabric and having fabric that you don't know what you're doing, like what to do with it. You just have it. Yeah. See, I do that a lot is I just buy random fabric and then they Mm -hmm. ask me and I'm like, I don't know. I'm just going to add it to my stash. But nothing is worse. (laughs) Nothing is worse than being like buying fabric and being like, what are you making? And it's like April and you're like, um, I'm making a dress for a cosplay. And you just. Yeah. Have to admit that you're a dweeb. (laughs) Mom and I were talking about that because we were talking about she had she had an issue at a, at the bank, and we like got into this whole tangent because there was one occasion where the every time she went to the bank, the teller was asking her why she was withdrawing money because of the like amount that it was, and my mom was just like, "That's none of your business." Yeah, that's awkward. There, it, there's like a lot of backstory to it, but it like I know, but that still is awkward. Yeah, she she just was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna close this account because it would be awkward to be like, so what are you withdrawing this money for? And you'd be like, I have to have a butt surgery. Like, yeah, I need cash to pay off my my bookie. Yeah, <laughs> she was like Ew. paying bills, and so she had to withdraw like a certain amount monthly. Mm-hmm. And it's because it was, like, the same amount on a regular basis. Like, oh, it's suspicious. And it's, like, no, it's expenses. Like, what? Yeah. So she was just, Why like. Why is it any of your business what I'm doing? Right? You just hold the money and you give it to me when I want it. Exactly. That's literally why you exist is to give it this back is, to me. I want to be an old Depression era man who just buries my money in mason jars in the backyard. Yeah. I don't trust those banks. When you die, we'll have to cut open your mattress. Okay. So the guy behind the counter is like, why are you buying this gun? And he told her it was for home protection. Fair. It's fine. It's just like in other stories where it's like, oh, they're getting arsenic. They they have rats. Yeah. Like, whatever. So on Halloween night, Joan borrowed the car from her friend, picked up Goldine, gave her an outfit to wear, like clothing. And they drove to the Fabiano house. Real quick. Can you imagine being the random uninvolved friend who lent her the car? No. (laughs) Like, I would be so mad. I would be so mad. How dare you drag my car into a murder? Right? (laughs) Yeah. If the police come to me and they're like, uh, we don't believe that Liz was actually home and you had borrowed my car. Yeah. I'd be furious. Yeah. And I wouldn't blame you. I would be real mad that you that you brought the police to my door Mm -hmm. how dare you (laughs) i'm sorry (laughs) how dare you do this in this hypothetical situation i'm i'll never do it again they arrive at the fabiano house at like 9 p.m and they sit there and they wait and they wait for two hours for the lights to go out inside the house so that they knew that everybody had gone to bed Mm mm-hmm But who goes grocery shopping at, like, 9 p.m. in the 50s? Like, you don't have a 24-hour Walmart or Giant Eagle. Like, I'm confused. Yeah. Well, I don't know if she told them that she was grocery shopping. I don't know what she told the Barretts. But she told the police that she used it for groceries. I don't know if the police knew when she had it. That's just the messiest detail for me. Yeah. Well, the whole thing is messy. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Goldine put on the clothes that she was given. She was given blue jeans, a khaki jacket, red gloves. They did her makeup real heavy. Mm -hmm. And then she put on a domino mask. Do you know what a domino mask is? No. A domino mask is like what Robin wears. Oh. Batman and Robin. Okay. Like, or the Incredibles. The little black one. Just the eyeballs. Yeah. Just covering your eyes. I didn't even know there was a name for that. The more you know. This has been a PSA. (laughs) So she approached the door and knocked. Fabiano answered, holding the bowl of candy, and he asked, yes, it's a little late for this, isn't it? So what I was going to say is, if it were children at my door, I would not say that. If it were a grown woman wearing a domino mask. Yeah. 
absolutely. Yeah. Isn't it a little late for this? Aren't you a little old to be trick-or-treating? You're like 43. Yeah. What is this? Who are you? (laughs) But I don't think he was expecting a 43-year-old woman wearing a Robin mask. No. I just am very confused. And like, I think part of my problem is that when we're talking about these cases, I'm always thinking of these people with like a logical, fully there (laughs) mentality. And I need to cut that out because clearly if you're murdering someone, you're not fully there. (laughs) No, you're not playing with a full deck of cards. Right. And I'm just like so confused as to how this made sense in their brain. But it's inherently because they're not, they're not there. They would have gotten away with it, though, had Goldine disposed of the weapon. Had had it not been for those rotten kids. (laughs) That's true. Scooby-Doo solved this. That's right. We haven't got there yet. (laughs) There is a Great Dane in this story that solves the case. (laughs) You're going to confuse some people. (laughs) That's not what happens. The police solved this case. Not Nancy Drew. Not Scooby-Doo. Not the Hardy Boys. The police. Not Robin. So he asks... Isn't it a little late for this? And Goldine raised the paper bag that she was holding. Mm -hmm. She had both hands inside of it. Mm -hmm. So she gripped the gun inside the paper bag. And she replied, no. Before shooting him in the chest. Yikes. Yeah. So that's where the shell is. It's in the bag. It's still in the gun. Oh. It's a revolver. I didn't connect that. You said that it was a revolver, but that, like, didn't compute. So, for those who don't know, a revolver-style gun, when you fire, there's there's bullets in the chamber. And when you fire, it fires the bullet out and goes to the next available chamber, but the shell stays inside the chamber. Mm -hmm. So... There was no, it didn't like shoot it out the side. It, she didn't dump it. It was just in the gun. So. Yeah. Yeah. But if it did, it would still be in the bag. Right. Yes. She shot him through the bag, basically. Which I assume that's just to conceal the fact that she was carrying a gun. Yes. So that he didn't open the door to a woman with a gun. Yeah. And be like, ah, this lady a has gun. a gun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she ran back to the car where Joan was waiting and they drove off. Mm-hmm. That's what the 15-year-old boy saw the car driving off. Mm-hmm. They stopped at some point and burned the clothes that they had been wearing. Okay. Then they apparently, I guess, changed. Joan drove with Goldine to the home of Margaret Barrett, and they parked the car on the street. So they dropped the car off. Mm-hmm. Joan then kissed Goldine and said, thank you. Square on the lips. She kissed her square on the lips said thank you and then forget you ever knew me whoa ice cold wow how mad would you be you just murdered somebody and then immediately get dumped yeah yeah wow harsh yeah they both walked home they walked their separate ways goldine still had the murder weapon and later took it to the L.A. branch of the Bullock Department store and put it in the lockbox. Well, which is where we... Everything's coming full circle. Yeah. Yeah. She should have thrown it in the La Brea tar pit. She really should have. Like I said, if she hadn't put the it, the the weapon in the lockbox, I don't, I don't know that they wouldn't have ever solved this. But they wouldn't have had a lot of evidence to connect it to anybody. Especially because... If it was in her house, it would have made more sense because she said she bought it for home protection. But she couldn't explain why it was used in the murder. Would they, how would they, would they have been able to tell that it was exactly that gun? Yeah. It's the same way that they did it with the lockbox. What they would do is they would fire a round out of this gun. Okay. See, I didn't know if they were able to do that yet in 57. Yes, they knew about lands and grooves in 57. Okay, never mind then. Yeah, she should have thrown it in the tar pits. Yeah. I'm glad they got caught, but she should have thrown it in the tar pits. She should have. So the police arrested Goldine because they know that this is her gun. It's registered to her. That's how they knew it was hers. It didn't have anything to do with like how they didn't know who rented the lockbox or who put it in the locker, but they knew it was hers because it was registered to her. She bought it. Right. Goldine was described as being very meek. 
and like quiet mild mannered Mm -hmm. and goldine told them everything (laughs) she immediately just like spilled the beans yeah she said quote i had no motive personally whatever motive i had was to please joan i was always easily influenced i have been impressionable and always trusting wow unquote i consider myself a follower but like not like that yeah i i find that i'm somebody who trusts people easily and who like shares with people easily oh, and i that. always i always catch myself being like you have to quit that yeah. you have to quit that because at the same time i'm very anxious and i i know a lot about true crime and stuff and i need to be more careful who i'm trusting is that are you talking about me no (laughs) no i've known you long enough that i think we can trust each other i'm a 38 special (laughs) if you were a gun you'd be a 38 special oh god so back to goldine and joan the police arrested Joan mm-hmm. because now they have Goldeen talking about it. Right. And the two women were examined extensively by psychiatrists to see if they were fit to stand trial. Do you want to know why? <sighs> is it because they were gay? Yes, it is. So the court was unsure whether homosexuality would give them a defense of insanity. Dear Lord. I'm just telling you what happened. I know. And I think it's one of those things where, like, I forget how far back we were then. Because Mm -hmm. I feel like we're still at a negative, right? Like, if it's a spectrum, you know, we're at a negative. But, like, I forget how negative it was. I think in terms of a lot of things, our nation has come very far. But we still have a long way to go on a lot of things. I would agree with that. Yeah, I'm. Last time I checked, being gay was not, you know, reason crazy to murder thing. somebody. I remember my psych teacher in college, like expressly being like, homosexuality is not considered like a deviant behavior or a like a crazy person thing, mm-hmm. for lack of better words here. So, even though they were extensively examined, the case did go to trial. Right. Your next slide here. Which, like, as it should have gone to trial. Yes. So you've got here the woman on the right in the picture of the two women and the solo picture. That's Joan Rabel. Okay. The woman on the left who looks like Queen Elizabeth a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Is Goldine. So you can see their two personalities. You can see how how Goldine is very, like, diminutive and shy looking. She's sort of bent. And Joan is smiley. This is like, these are trial photos. Right photos that were taken outside the trial so what the heck (laughs) goldine was remorseful and was often crying during the trial oh goodness joan was described as being either hollow-eyed and stone-faced or smiling nonchalantly Mm -hmm. i just i read the subtext on the one photo which says that mrs rabel joan rabel denies Mm -hmm. any part in the Sun Valley killing. And I'm like, then who was driving the car, Joan? She was getting groceries. Ugh. I couldn't have done it. I was getting groceries at 9 o'clock at night. Yeah, okay. Joan pled not guilty. And Goldine pled not guilty by reason of ins- insanity. Mm-hmm. She was not using homosexuality as her insanity plea, though. She was saying that Joan had basically coerced her. Right. She said that, that Joan had had her under some sort of spell. Mm. So some more spooky witchy things for the Halloween episode. I almost at the beginning of this called you Eliza Booth, (laughs) but I didn't. Mostly because I couldn't think of anything cute for mine. So I just went with trick or treat instead. It's okay. So even though they had entered both uh, entered not guilty uh, pleas. Right. One saying she was not guilty by reason of insanity. The other just saying she didn't have anything to do with it. They both changed their pleas and took a plea deal for those who don't know that means that the da says if you plead guilty to this you'll have a lighter sentence right so they took the plea deal and they were sentenced to five years to life in prison wow for second for second degree murder Mm -hmm. both of them were eventually released though i don't know when Mm -hmm. so they didn't serve life 
but both of them were eventually released. Yeah, five to life is something I don't feel like you hear very often. No. Originally, I thought they were just sentenced to five years, and I thought, that's kind of light. But five to life is basically the entire spectrum of time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how long they served. I don't know when they were released, but it's assumed they were released around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Goldine died in 1999. Oh, wow. And Betty sold the beauty salon after Pete had died and appeared to, I guess, have remarried in 1966, Mm -hmm. though some things say she never remarried. Like I said, details like that get squishy because I don't have any, like, official sources. Right. But she died in 1999 as well at the age of 81. Interesting. And this is the most interesting part to me. Joan Rabel just, like, disappeared off the face of the earth. There's nothing. No one knows what happened to her after she got released from prison. That's really weird. It is. There's, like, nothing at all. I wonder if she changed her name. It's possible. I don't know what she was doing. She's probably dead now, too, though. I'm sure. That is interesting. I would think I would think she would have had to have changed her name and moved. Probably. But... That is the trick-or-treat slaying of Peter Fabiano. Hmm. Do you think Betty was in on it? I don't know. I Do really you think Betty don't... was a lesbian? I also don't know. Inconclusive. I really think it is inconclusive because despite what Betty could have been, maybe Peter was abusive, maybe he wasn't, Maybe Joan was infatuated and it wasn't mm-hmm. reciprocated. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so many questions that I have still yeah. that I don't think anything is conclusive. We do know for sure who killed him. Yeah. And I'm confident that Joan was involved in that as well. You think? Yeah. I don't. There's no doubt in my mind. Because otherwise, why would Goldine Pizer have killed him? She had never met Betty. Yeah. That's fair. Like she said, she had no motive to kill this guy, except that Joan told her she that he was bad. See, I'm thinking, like, and I guess we don't really know because she dropped off the face of the earth. But for me, if, if the story had gone that Betty and Joan had any kind of relationship, be it friendly or otherwise, after she got out of jail... Then I would be for sure. Betty, was I don't in on think it. they did. Right, so that is kind of one of the factors that I'm like, eh. Mm. Plus, she married another man, maybe. Possibly. Possibly. But yes or no. She she could have still been covering her like covering it up. Right. It could have been another lavender marriage. Maybe. I don't know. I don't feel like I have enough details to say. I don't either. This is a very sparse, this is a very sparse, sparse on some details. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Elizabeth. Yes. What are you reading? What are you recommending? So right now I am reading a book, which as I understand it is the first in a series. It's called The Library of the Unwritten Mm -hmm. by A.J. Hackwith. And... I'm listening to it. I'm about two and a half hours in to this audiobook. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to recommend it, but the jury is still out on it. <laughs> <laughs> the writing is good. I think I think it's well written. The narration is superb. We have been joined by the dog. <laughs> she wants to know what I'm reading. I was going to tell the people that... Hazel has not been in the last couple episodes because she's just been, like, hanging out with Ryan. Yeah. She was down on the couch waiting for him to come home. I heard her bark when he came in. So, yeah. So she has just come upstairs with him. But she's not dead. She's here. The thing about this book, though, that, like, I'm still kind of unsure. Mm -hmm. And I still want to keep kind of giving it a shot. I, it's a me thing. (laughs) <laughs> this is going to sound like so pretentious and like rude. And I mean, no offense by this. I am back and forth in my head about whether or not I think the premise is absolutely ridiculous and stupid. 
Well, why don't you tell us a little about the premise? So, very vaguely, the premise is that there is a library located in hell. Mm -hmm. And it is the library of the unwritten books, which means that any time an author begins to write a book, but it is not yet finished, this book gets basically entered into the shelves of this library in hell, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know why exactly, and maybe I'll figure it out later, but these books basically have, like life energy in them I guess and they can like manifest themselves awake Mm -hmm. and so they the book will still exist like the physical book will still exist Mm -hmm. but the book also manifests a physical form of a character within the book and usually the character wants to like meddle like either their like the first character you meet is a girl out of a horror book a horror book so Mm -hmm. she's like please don't send me back because she's like this character in this book who's like being tortured basically Mm -hmm. and it's like they're trying to convince her that she's just a character in a book and not real so like there's this weird humanity but it's not humanity Mm -hmm. and then (laughs) The next character that comes to life is the hero of a story. And for some reason, book characters are obsessed with their authors. And so this character goes to Seattle to meet the author of the book and, like, meddles with her life. And I just, I don't know if I can get behind the the idea that the book just, like, apparates a physical person into being well i'd be interested to hear what you think about it when you get closer to the end yeah yeah because there there's maybe a little bit of foreshadowing that there's more to the characters Mm -hmm. than just being like an apparition but i'm not far enough in yet so and there's this whole like angels and demons thing going on and but you're still recommending it yeah i'm still gonna recommend it because it's interesting. It's one of those things mm-hmm. that, like, I'm not sure if I'm sold on it, but I've definitely never read anything like it before. Well, that's neat. Yeah. That's very neat. Yeah. So it's very fantasy, if that's your thing. So far, there's no romance in it, which I know some people don't want any mm-hmm. romance in their books. So, again, I'm only two and a half hours into the audiobook, uh, but so far, no romance. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm recommending. I am still reading The Midnight Library. We're both reading books about libraries. (laughs) I'm almost finished with it, and I would recommend it. I recommended it last week, so I'm still plugging through it. But I'm, if you want to hear the, like, description of that book, go to last week's episode. I talk more about it in that episode. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to recommend a book that I read earlier this year called Wilder Girls by Rory Power. It is kind of a YA book it's um like teenage girls and stuff but it's really good it's basically a group of girls in a boarding school that's on an island off the coast of Maine Mm -hmm. and for whatever reason there is this disease that is taking over the island and the girls on the island is it COVID that's the thing is like I started reading it and it was like quarantining and (laughs) and that kind of thing but the disease is very like it's changing their bodies in these like really crazy ways and it's really good it's got basically an all-girl an all-female cast Mm -hmm. it has romance like a little bit of it and so it's if you're into you want some like an LGBT friendly book or a book that Mm -hmm. has some LGBT representation this has it has a, a a couple characters who are LGBT. Yeah. Which I really enjoyed. It's nice to have somebody write a book where it's that's not the the focus of the book. Mm-hmm. It's not about the fact that they're gay, but it's just like a detail. Yeah. I think it's really good and if it's if you want to get away from covid and quarantine and plaguey style stuff, maybe it's not for you, but mm-hmm. and if you don't like YA, maybe it's not for you, but it's very good. It's a quick read mm-hmm. as well. I really enjoyed it. Nice. I will backtrack really quick because you made me think of it. The book that I'm reading, The Library of the Unwritten, it is 
fairly diverse in that's good its characters i forgot to mention that because i got it as a recommendation of diverse fantasy so there is some diversity in it if that's your thing i haven't seen i any, love that i haven't seen any lgbt representation but i have seen racial diversity so that's nice yeah so elizabeth yes hannah where can the people find us we are Briefcase Crimes across all social media platforms, including Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. You can find full episodes of our podcast anywhere that you listen to podcasts, as well as on YouTube. If you would like to support us monetarily, you can make a donation at coffee.com. That's K O F I.com forward slash briefcase crimes or you can purchase our book recommendations on bookshop.org that supports us as well as small local bookshops by donating 75 percent of profits to independent bookshops and we get 10 percent of the proceeds as well and all of those links to everything i mentioned are available in our link tree which can be found in our bio and the description of this episode yeah and with that would you like to wrap this up yep thank you for listening and we'll see you next time bye bye